welcome. Can, can you hear me? Give me a thumbs up. Can you hear me? I've got you on two different screens. I want to see your smiling faces. All right, let's get started. Good evening, and I hope you have come to have a good time. <coughs> uh, my name is Kelly Adams. I am this year's GP Solo Diversity Director. On behalf of the entire Diversity Board, I'd like to welcome you to our second diversity series, Activate Diversity from the Rooney Rule to the C-Suites and Sports. I am thrilled that you are joining us tonight and would like for you to get comfortable, prepare to engage and enjoy our series tonight. We have two incredible moderators amidst all of our amazing panelists. Our moderators tonight are Jamie Boston. He's a retired Army JAG. He is a 2015 Diversity Fellow. We were actually fellows together and currently serves as the GP Solos Division I Administration Director. He is also this year's recipient of the 2000, or 2020 Difference Makers Award for making a difference through service to the profession. Uh, Aaron Abrams is our current diversity fellow. He is the founder and managing partner of Abram Law. He focuses on areas of criminal law, OWI defense and family law. At this point, I would like to extend a special thank you to our GP solo chair, Alfreda Coward. She has been very supportive and invested in our goals this year, and we are very grateful to have her as our chair. I'd like to acknowledge that she is the very first African-American female to chair this division. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors this evening, Thompson Reuters. At this time, on behalf of Thompson Reuters, I would like for those of you who have a glass to raise it, Somebody raise it. If you don't, oh, there we go. I see them. Raise your glass. Now, let me just say this. I have sparkling cider, but it's okay. You can have whatever you want to have. And let's toast to a great evening. Enjoy and please engage. Thank you again and welcome. Kelly, thanks for that great introduction. Welcome everybody. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being here tonight. I know everybody has a busy schedule. But I promise you, we have a phenomenal program planned for you, some outstanding panelists, and I think you're going to learn a lot. And it doesn't matter whether you're a sports fan or not, old or young, a lawyer or not, I think there's something in this program for you. So please sit back, enjoy your beverage, and relax. And at this time, I'd like to introduce our panelists for the evening. They are, first, Mr. David Kelly, Chief Legal Officer of Business and Basketball for the Golden State Warriors. Second, we have Mr. Mika Fields. Council of Global Sports Marketing and Data Privacy for New Balance. Third, Mr. Wes Unsell Jr., lead assistant coach for the Denver Nuggets. Fourth, Ms. Tracy Branchford, Branchford, sorry, partner at Stinson LLP. Next, Mr. Wayne Gomes, a retired Major League Baseball player, pitcher to be exact, and owner of the Virginia Baseball Academy. And last but not least, Mr. Brian Baptiste, Director of Athletics and Recreation at LaSalle University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have an outstanding group. But before we get to them, I want to introduce one more person, and that is Mr. David Samuel. He's a second year law student at Drexel Law School and also the co-president of the Drexel Law School Sports Entertainment Law Society. David, take it away. Thank you, Jamie, for that great introduction. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's panel. Sports is synonymous with the American way of life. Sports shapes relationships and influences our everyday schedules and even allows for people of different backgrounds to come together and agree on a particular topic. As sports has evolved, both men and women can see themselves represented on the field or on the court. But we are here tonight because those individuals making the key decisions don't look like many of us whether on the sidelines as a head coach or behind the scenes as a CEO, CFO, COO, or what is referred to as the C-suite, when it comes to these decision-making positions in major sports organizations, it is rare that minorities, both male and female, find themselves faced with the job to make a major decision. In 2003, the National Football League, along with one of its most prominent owners, took a step forward and changed the way candidates are considered for these decision-making positions. In 2003, Dan Rooney, owner and chairman of the Pittsburgh Steelers, while serving as the chairman 
of the NFL's Workplace Diversity Committee partnered with the National Football League and instituted the Rooney Rule. The Rooney Rule requires NFL organizations with head coaching, senior football operations, and major coordinator vacancies to interview at least one minority candidate for, to fill the, uh, the open vacancy. In the first three years of its inaction, minority head coaching hires in the NFL increased from 6% to 22%. Coaches such as Mike Tomlin, Ron Rivera, Anthony Lynn, and front office members such as Andrew Barry, Chris Greer, and recently Jason Wright have reaped the benefits of this rule and are currently flourishing in their role with their respective organizations. With the institution of the Rooney Rule, owners of NFL organizations are required to go beyond their comfort zone when it comes to filling vacancies. The Rooney Rule forced NFL owners to seek out minority candidates who had similar or even greater expertise about the sport of football. Mr. Rooney realized the importance of diversity in the workplace and how the inclusion of individuals who know the game, regardless of their ethnicity or gender, would allow the NFL and its organizations to flourish well beyond expectations. But even with a deliberate call for diversity in place, professional sports is still faced with the disparity when it comes to minority representation in coaching and C-suite positions compared to minority player representation. It begs the question whether initiatives like the Rooney Rule are truly serving its intended purpose and providing more opportunities for minorities and not just serving as another procedural step in the hiring process. It also raises the concern whether this rule has provided more clarity in the hiring process of coaches and C-suite personnel. Tonight, you will hear from a great group of panelists who work across the spectrum of sports at the professional and collegiate levels. We will take a deeper dive into the impact the Rooney Rule has had on the National Football League. We will also discuss systemic discrimination and the disproportionate representation of minorities in key decision-making positions in Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association, and collegiate athletics. The Rooney Rule has allowed for minorities to develop dreams beyond just the playing field. Will there be a time where any person can look at an organization and know exactly what they need to do to obtain one of these coveted positions? Thank you again and, and enjoy tonight's discussion. Thank you so much for that intro, David. I'm excited to get into this, so let's do it. So first and foremost, we have Mr. David Kelly up. Now, Mr. Kelly, it is my understanding that you are the product of an HBCU, the Morehouse College, just like myself. First of all, thank you for continuing to show that you can tell a Morehouse man, but you can't tell him much. So my question is, there's still a belief though, that HBCUs don't adequately prepare um, our students for the world. How did your HBCU and the experience prepare you for the success in your career currently? Oh, great question. Always, always a pleasure to, to, to give props to Morehouse. First off, just really happy to be here. Um, going to Morehouse made me who I am. Um, it prepared me academically, but far more importantly, it prepared me from a emotional, psychological standpoint. Um, I was at a point in my life as a young man, I, need, I really needed to get into what my identity was and understand who I was and be proud of who I was. And that's what I got out of Morehouse. Um, and I don't know that I get the same sort of sense of self um, going to another school that I got from going to Morehouse. And so um, I think that HBCUs of all stripes um, prepare their students extremely well to succeed inside of the, inside of the, um, inside of the workforce, both from an act academic standpoint, but more importantly, from, I would say, a psychological standpoint. Uh, when you, oftentimes you're walking in the rooms and you're the only one who looks like you inside of that room, it's good to have that strong sense of self when you're, in, when you're entering that room so that you can move and operate. Okay, okay, thank you for that. So as the chief legal officer for an NBA team, how were you able to activate diversity and how would you advise your fellow, you know, white, black, male, as well as uh, female, um, as well as other 
uh, counterparts to do the same in today's environment? Yeah, so I think the first thing is to, to make sure that you see it as a, as a priority. Um, I do see it as a priority and I understand that diversity in the sports space is not only race, it's not only racial, it's gender, um, especially in sports. And so understanding that as well. And so trying to be intentional when I'm trying to create opportunities, um, whether it's internally hiring inside of my, my legal department, making sure that I'm interviewing diverse um, candidates for roles. When I'm giving work out to, once you're the general counsel, you're in a position where you can actually give out work. And so that I'm, I'm seeking out diverse partners um, to, to, to manage the matters um, that we have at the Golden State Warriors. And then where the subject matter expert is not a diverse person, making sure that they have diversity on their teams. And so are there associates at, at, a, at a firm that I maybe have, have created a relationship with um, at an event here or a conference there um, and that it would be someone that I would wanna advocate for at a firm that maybe I'm already giving work to? Is there a way that I can drop that person's name into a partner's ear um, to say, do you have a relationship with X person um, I met him or her at a conference, I really was impressed with them. I don't know if you know them, but it would be great if there are opportunities on our, you know, on, on the matters that you're working on for us, that you would consider them. Um, that having been an associate at a large law firm, um, when the person who's paying the bills and, and, and holds the purse strings is, 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 is referencing you in that way, that goes a long way. Um, and so understanding the position that you have, we all have spheres of influence um, we all have certain power in, in being intentional and willing to, to, to use it. In addition, um, in terms of hiring at the Golden State Warriors, our HR department has implemented a bit of a Rooney rule for all positions that we hire at the Golden State Warriors. So in our Rooney rule is essentially for any, any position that we're hiring, we need to bring in a diverse slate, slate of candidates. And that's around race, it's around gender, it's across the board. But then more, I won't say more importantly, but equally important, we have a diverse slate of individuals who are on the hiring committee who are interviewing that candidate. Um, so it's not just I'm coming in for an interview at the Golden State Warriors and I'm seeing people, all people who don't look like me. No, I'm seeing, I'm meeting with, with black men, white women across the board at, at the Warriors. And those are the people who are going to ultimately be making the decision in terms of hiring me or not hiring. And so I think, the other part of the Rooney rule is making sure that you have a diverse slate of, um, of, of, of people in the hiring committee. Okay, great answer. So continuing talking about hiring and because you're working in the NBA, in 2014, Donald Sterling, the former owner of the Los Angeles Clippers, came under fire for some, we'll say seemingly uh, racist statements where one of his recorded grievances were that his, his, he had issues with his girlfriend at the time associating with black people. How much influence does the owner of these organizations have when it comes to hiring? And also what potential impact could this have on their applicability of the Rooney rule in their organizations? So it's interesting. So putting aside the fact that you have someone who is is owning a team where 80% of the, of, the, of, the, of the people who are the front line, who are the face of his franchise, African-American men having issues with African-American men, putting that aside just, just for a moment. Um, obviously owners have, a, have a, a, a great influence on the hiring of, of, of certain roles, but most roles that are hired, um, you know, at least in my experience at the Warriors, the ownership is not involved in. So they obviously are gonna be involved in the hiring of the head coach, hiring of the general manager, hiring of the president. Um, but any of the roles that I wanna hire, I'm not, I don't have to bring that up to ownership. And so we have, if we have a diverse slate or a, a diverse group at our executive team, we are empowered to make our own hiring decisions. And then the people who report to us are empowered to make their own hiring decisions as well. Um, but there obviously is gonna be a tone that's set at, at the ownership level um, and I'm not sure, it, obviously the tone that was set at the Clippers was not, not the right tone. Um, and it was important for Adam Silver to take the steps that he took um, in, in 2014. And I don't know if everyone remembers, but Adam Silver had just come in as the commissioner of, of the NBA a couple of months before. And he made the, at that point in time, unprecedented decision that after Sterling's comments, he was gonna strip him of his franchise. Um, that is not, I mean, this is a legal conference, so that is not 
a, a, that is a legally risky decision um, that, he, that he made. And to me, it, it, it underscores the importance of diversity because it's very difficult to make that decision. It's easier to make that decision when you have a diverse owner who was Sterling's colleague and Michael Jordan, who's coming out with a statement condemning Sterling's uh, comments. When you have Vivek Ranadive, who was, who was an owner of the Kings, condemning the comments. And then you had all other owners similarly, but I think Jordan was the first um, condemning those comments. And then you had the, the, the two teams that were involved inside of the, the, the playoffs at the time that those comments were made by Sterling were the Clippers and us and, and the Warriors. The coaches of those teams were Doc Rivers and Mark Jackson. So you had two black men in positions of power there. Um, I remember at that point in time coming to, to the next game and actually feeling like, should I even be at this game? Should we be playing this game? Am I, I was two years into the job. Am I going to have to find a new job? Because if the NBA doesn't handle this in the right way, I really don't want to be involved or associated. So to have the, the black leadership that you had from River, and I know the players are feeling the same way. So that leadership that Doc Rivers was showing to his team and that Mark Jackson was showing to his team helped to keep the guys together so that Adam a couple of days later could make the decision that he was gonna make. Um, but I think it, it just shows that you have to have representation, you have to have diversity at all different levels because it, it allowed Adam or helped Adam to make the decision that I know that he wanted to make already. Um, but when you had people giving them that, that, that spine, I'm sure the lawyers are, if I was his lawyer, I would say, yeah, it's a legally risky thing to, thing to do. Um, maybe we come with a, a, a heavy fine but when he made the decision that he made, I think it put the NBA on a completely different trajectory. And, and I think it's, it's helped the NBA deal with what's happened in, as you saw with, with Kaepernick and NFL, we didn't have the, similar situations inside of the NBA. As you saw the situations that happened um, this summer with respect to George Floyd and the way the NBA handled it. I think all of that trick goes back to what happened in 2014. And the NBA has, has benefited financially from that decision. Okay. And uh, the final question I have for you um, we, we talked about it from the top down. Now let's talk about it from the cushy bottom up. And I say cushy because we're talking about the players now. Um, and it's kind of hard to be at the bottom when you're making at least six figures. Um, in regards to certain coaches being hired, um, what role, if any, do the players have in that hiring process? Yeah, so, so players are gonna, always going to have a role in the hiring of the coach. Um, I mean, the real decision makers are, you know, the, the ownership, the investor group, um, and your GM are, are ultimately, ultimately the people that make the decision. But there's no way that a decision, when someone reaches the level of a Steph Curry, um, we're not going to change Steve Curry and bring in a new coach without consulting him. It's kind of like the hiring committee that we talked about a little bit, you know, a little bit earlier. That would be your, your highest ranking employee and you may wanna get his opinion on these things. Um, and so, yeah, so players will have a voice inside of those sorts of decisions as well because that is who they're gonna to have to work with. Um, that, that's that's, that's their, their leadership group. So they need to weigh in on those decisions. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kelly for uh, giving us those answers. I know you have to run cause you're just that busy and I feel it. Um, so, uh, at this point, we are going to, I, that concludes all my questions. Um, for you, Mr. Kelly, is there any last minute things you would like to say? No, I just appreciate the opportunity to, to be here and um, and just salute you for having this this, this sort of uh, discussion because it's, 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 it's very important inside of the sports industry. Um, sports industry is obviously not the most important industry that we have inside of the country, but it is a very visible one. So we need to increase diversity in, in sports. Okay, thank you so much. All right. Next, folks, we have Miss Damika Fields. How you doing, Miss Fields? I'm good. How are you? Uh, I'm I'm doing better now. Now that we've started, I feel a little <laughs> more comfortable. You know, we'll <laughs> um, so as far as I know, um, and all and you've told us you're also an HBCU alum. I gotta give it, yeah. gotta give a shout out to HBCUs. Yes. Um, and HBCUs are receiving a lot of attention. From the female perspective, how did your HBCU experience prepare you for success in your current field? Yeah, so I have to shout out Howard University, of course. 
because that is the HBCU. Morehouse is great, but Howard is the HBCU. And then I have to shout out Kamala Harris, of course, uh, which is why Howard is more in the spotlight now. Um, but, but I think kind of like David said, my HBCU experience was amazing. Um, I think it prepares you mentally to go out into, you know, the real world. But one thing that I don't think people think about, especially if you haven't attended an HBCU or if you're not familiar with them, is how diverse Black people are, right? So you, you go to an HBCU and you think when you walk into the room, everyone looks like you, which is great, which is a great feeling. But then socioeconomic backgrounds are completely different, right? You have the people that are really well off and their parents are business owners, executives and, and senators and in government. And you have the people who worked right, to put themselves through school, kind of like I did. So even within the Black community, there's so much diversity and going to a school where you can see everyone that looks like you, but then has a different background. And so you're still able to learn from them. Um, I think that really helps you in life as well. And then once you get through, you know, the hurdles of just being in college, being on your own, another thing I think is just you know, the alumni, your alumni base, like the Howard University alumni base for me is amazing. And just seeing so many people, so many of our famous alum, right? Your entertainment alum, but then your Thurgood Marshalls and people like that, Zora Neale Hurston, who um, you're just like, wow, these are the people I can look up to. So all the things that David said, but to add on that diversity of black people, um, is, was really, really big for me. And I still talk to Howard people every day who, who are helping me further my career. Thank you for that. And uh, how can HBCUs and professional sports partner to create a pipeline for students beyond being simply being athletes to um, improve the accessibility between qualified diverse students and these uh, professional sports organizations getting into um, those front offices? Yes, yeah, so I think the biggest thing you mentioned was the word pipeline. And so that's what we were looking for when I was at the Vikings was creating a pipeline with these schools so that we can bring talent in and it can be on a continuous basis. You don't, because it takes a lot of money to recruit sometimes, right? And so you want to make sure you get a return. And so when you create these pipelines and these really long lasting relationships where maybe you can bring in an intern this year, but not the next year. But once you start talking to the students, maybe they don't start off as an intern, but you know you have a marketing position available um, for someone who's two years out and you've built this relationship with the school where you can ask them for a recommendation and they can send you a list of candidates because you're looking for um, right, that diverse slate. So I really think it is building that pipeline. I will plug a group that we worked with at the Vikings and I hope to work with at New Balance, um, which is, now I'm blanking. His name is Gregory Gibson and it's a 24 hour case competition for kids. It used to be at South by Southwest, but we will have it in the fall from now on. But it really is giving the students from I think 40 HBCUs this year, the chance to do this case and then to present in front of companies, including the NBA, including the NFL, the Vikings were there. We had some individual teams and then other companies like Dell, but really giving them the chance to learn and grow and then to present. And that helps us to see the talent that's out there rather than just seeing the resumes. We'll see those, but let's see how they present. Let's see how they act under pressure because it's just 24 hours and they have to figure it out right, and work in a team, and we're with them through the whole process. So those are ways, those types of events are ways that you can really, really build a pipeline and not just pick and choose, but hopefully continue that long-lasting relationship. Okay, outstanding. Um, as a Black woman in a white male-dominated area, uh, can you speak to your experiences? And simply put, is it enough for organizations to hire a woman or does the diversification of the C-suite require a deeper dive into diversity? Yes, so I wanna go back. Battle of the Brains is the group I was talking about that the name slipped my mind, Battle of the Brains. But I think it really is important. I know David talked about diversity, not just being race, 
But what I have seen on the football side and in the organizations I've been a part of is that there was a really, there was a lot of attention paid to gender right, gender diversity, but not as much paid to racial diversity. And it seems like, to be quite frank, gender diversity would be the easy route, right? I wanna say the cop out, but it would be the easy route. So if you look on the business side of a team, I don't know every team, but I know a lot of the NFL teams, you will see a number of women in these positions on the business side. Um, and for us, it was white women, right? But when I left the Vikings, there were only two other black women out of 250 people still there but when you make that argument that we need diversity it's like well we have right it may be 60 40 on the business side with women so we're diverse and we have four women evps and you're like yeah but they everyone looks the same right when i walk down the hallway i may see other women but i see no women of color i see no black women and so i think we have to start you know, paying closer attention to gender and race and not use gender as a cop out. Well, yes, we have women, but let's start talking about Indian women. Let's talk about Latina women. Let's talk about black women. Okay. Um, so in 2009, the Rooney rule was expanded to include general managers and front office staff, but still requires only one minority candidate to be interviewed. Should the required number of diverse applicants be higher? Why or what changes would you make? So to, to be realistic, I don't think it's about the number of candidates because a lot of times when coaches or GMs or team owners go into these meetings, they kind of know who they want to hire. Almost like if you're in-house, you know, the outside attorney you want to hire, or if you're an attorney, everyone knows an attorney, right? And so... I think a lot of times these coaches already know who they want, GMs know who they want. So I think it has to be a it has to be a deeper dive into the Rooney Rule. And a little bit when um, when the Rooney Rule was created, it was so successful because it was like a personal plea. Mr. Rooney could make the personal plea to people. He was one of the most um, important owners at the time. So he could go and say, you know, guys, I, we really need to have, and that's why we had a period where there were like five GMs and eight black coaches, right? And we're not even there now and we're further in time, but he could make the personal plea and people respected him so much. It was like, okay, we got you. So he did his part in making sure there was a pipeline. That's gone, right? Our most influential team owner now is Jerry Jones and maybe Arthur Blank. And I just don't think that is, I'm not gonna speak for them, but I don't think that is right. Their most important thing, like that's not what they're focusing on. And so I think we gotta get past the number of people, get past the compensatory picks that now they wanna give. And now we're like, oh, now you're giving picks to choose black people to be coaches, right? You hate for it to have to go to that. I feel like we have to find a way, we can talk about this forever, but find a way where you see the importance and you see the talent. You get to know the talent of the person and see that they are talented and they belong versus like, we're gonna interview this black person, but we know, or we're gonna interview this Latinx person, but we know who we already want. So I think we gotta dig a little bit deeper than, than finding a number. Okay. And um, recently you've signed Kawhi Leonard, right? So looking at the relationship between athletes and the support of their sponsors in regard to social justice initiatives, another example, of course, being Colin Kaepernick um, and Nike, uh, what diversity initiatives have been implemented by New Balance as a result of pressure from athletes and the average consumer? So I think there's a two-pronged approach that most businesses are going to take when they're in the sponsor role. And I don't know if it's always because of pressure. A lot of times pressure from your consumer does help or pressure from your athlete. But I really think you have to look at it from an external perspective and internal perspective. Because you'll see like Nike has Colin Kaepernick and everyone's like, oh, they really supported him. But then you had the Instagram page, Nike while black. Right. And so they're saying, OK, you have Colin, but internally you're not supporting black people. So I think it's a two prong approach where you want to make sure internally you're supporting your black staff or your staff of color and your creative programs. And New Balance has initiated like diversity training, which I think they'll we will need to do a deeper dive because 
just surface level training is not the answer, right? So there's the diversity training and the diversity committees and the employee resource groups where you start to support people with money, right? And let them know that they have a place to come together and the company is behind them. So those things I've started to see being here for two months at New Balance. But then I think externally, what I've seen is with our like Coco Goff, who is um, a tennis player for those who don't know. And then Jaden Smith, who's one of our big influencers. It's working with them to see how they want their voice to be heard and how we can help them. So now we're gonna have a Black History Month line, which last year was our first year having a shoe. Now we're having a whole line and we're working with our athletes and our influencers to say, hey, do you wanna be the face? We know this is important to you. How can we involve you in the company so you feel like you are happy to represent the company and then we are supporting you because you want people to know, like Jaden has a food truck, you want people to know that you're really involved in this and this is something you really care about. So two pronged approach, but I think a company has to look at both sides because you don't wanna look externally to the consumer and your internals messed up, but you don't wanna have it internally and you're selling, right? And you're into making, you gotta make money and you want people to know externally you support your athletes and, and influencers as well. Okay, thank you so very much, uh, Attorney Fields. That was very informative. Um, that Those are all the questions that I have for you. And uh, please stick around because we're going to have fun in the breakout rooms. Thank you at the end. Jamie, it's on you. Thank you, my brother, Aaron. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, uh, Wes Unsell Jr. couldn't make it today because if you follow basketball, they surprisingly are starting a season within, what, 12 days from now. And uh, when I first brought this to him, he was thinking he had, you know, months to prepare. So apologize for not being here, but we're going to have a recording of my interview with him. Um, but before we do that, I do want to take a short liberty um, to dedicate this interview to Wesley Unsell Sr., who was Wes's father and was a Hall of Fame basketball player. And I will tell you, he was an even better man than he was a basketball player and Hall of Famer. I also want to take this interview and, and dedicate it to uh, Wes and I's best friend, brother, roommate, Jonathan England. He was a Caucasian, and I want to focus on that, Caucasian professor of African-American studies at the University of Maryland, who also passed this year. And so he always had a dream of the three of us doing a program together. And so I want to dedicate and tribute this moment to him. And so with that said, um, I want to say, you know, my best to the families of both Mr. Unsell and John, and our prayers are with you. We love you. And with that said, let's move on to the interview. Steve. The Rooney Rule, and I think by this point you probably got a definition of it, but what's your understanding of it in terms of what it's supposed to accomplish or what you thought it was supposed to accomplish? Well, I think it, uh, in its essence, you know, uh, is looked at as a, you know, affirmative action program to, you know, uh, get uh, minority candidates an opportunity to uh, be interviewed for potential head coaching positions. Um, I think in its, uh, you know, the impetus behind it was uh, was genuine, and I think necessary, especially at the time it was uh, it came into fruition. Um, the question, and, and I know we've talked to this uh, about this at length, is you know, a is it necessary uh, for diversity in hiring now, and does it have you know negative a negative impact at times on certain candidates? Okay. Well, what does diversity mean to you? Let's let's, let's back up a minute. Let's go back to diversity. And so, I guess the first question is. Do you think there's even a problem uh, in particular sports and, and with the NBA? And, and I say that with understanding that the NBA has, you know, predominantly black players, predominantly black stars, um, arguably, especially when you look at how things occurred in the bubble this past summer, they have a stronger voice probably than most major league or, or major sports uh, uh, athletes. So, you know, is it even a problem in the NBA? I don't want to make that assumption. And if so, mm -hmm. kind of elaborate on that. Well, I mean, I'll say this to, you know, kind of cover my bases. All Everything that I say is strictly my opinion. <laughs> Obviously, uh, you, the lawyers understand why I would have to say that. Uh, but uh, I think it's a systemic issue um, in society. Uh, you, you know, the you could say it's a microcosm or the NBA is a, just a subset of that. But when you look at the, um, the sport itself, um, the, the percentage of athletes compared to the, the decision makers in the front office compared to the ownership, um, it, it just doesn't seem to match up. Now, a lot of that has, there, there are other reasons, of course, 
Um, but I will say the NBA, as far as you know, major sports leagues, seems to be more progressive, forward thinking, and uh, diversified than uh, than any others. Okay, and so let's talk about that. So again, it's unique for you because you literally just finished some interviews this past couple months. So. Mm -hmm. Talk to us so that the audience understands how does the interview process work and then kind of tie that in with diversity, if there's even a connection. Oh, I think every uh, interview is unique. It's different. Um, I, would, I wouldn't say it's much different than any interview anyone uh, would, would have to go through. Uh, you have to obviously be, uh, you be ready and prepared. You have to be qualified for the position. Um, but sometimes it's, it's just a get to know you process. They've done their homework. They've done a lot of background, um, not only in your field, but also, um, you know, from your college friends, from your, your former employers, coworkers, so on. So they, they've already done a lot of homework. I think by the time you get to that point, especially for a head coaching position, I think it's just to, um, confirm what they already know or to make sure this is a fit for their their particular franchise okay and so you know i, I don't want to put words in your mouth but i think you're you you said that statistics support that obviously things are a little skewed um mm -hmm. not necessarily you necessarily had bad interactions or discriminated against but there's seems to be something that doesn't match up yet so um from your position you know what can we do better uh, and, and i'll ask from from the athletic side of it and then let's go mm -hmm. into kind of the you know, civilian or the community side, if anything, we can do to help improve those numbers so they're better closely correlated? Well, I think it's, you know, look at the players and you say, well, and I don't know the exact number, if it's 85, 90% of the players are, you know, African-American males, uh, then why are we so underrepresented, you know, in, in front office positions? And I think a lot of it too is, you know, do players, as they transition from, front off from a playing career, do they even look at a front office situation as a post-career opportunity? Do, is it even looked at as an option? Is, let me interrupt think, real quick. Is that explained mm -hmm. to you to players or even young coaches or young scouts? Is that is there any program in the NBA now that you're aware of that kind of says, hey, look, you need to think about this when you're done with whatever role you have in the NBA right now? Well, yeah. I mean, we always look at, the uh, you know, the – the franchise icons and, and the marquee players where money's not an issue, obviously. So they're going to live the rest of their lives happily and not worry about, you know, earning a paycheck. There is another subset of players um, that whether their career is short due to injury or, you know, whether it's a talent issue, the average lifespan of an NBA player is a little over four years. Okay. So it's not, you know, unless you're in that high echelon, um, that you can guarantee you can retire and just live the rest of your life without, you know, having to worry about a job. So there are programs actually that the NBA, the NBA Players Association um, have begun to kind of push that agenda to, to broaden this, the spectrum for a lot of players and say, look, you know, it, whether it's coaching, whether it's, you know, scouting, these are opportunities that are out there, um, you know, kind of see how you like it. They have, uh, you know, opportunities over the summer to, shadow, you know, assistant coaches work clinics, do other things to kind of prepare and, and open that, that field to them, um, probably for the first time. And so, I mean, is that enough or what else, you know, if you were kind of king for a day or even commissioner for a day, what advice, you know, and, and maybe you get this opportunity. That's another question for you, actually. Do you, you as a coach, get the opportunity to voice these type of things? You talk about the mm -hmm. players. I don't know what it lo looks like in the, you know, that the higher echelon of, of the organization, do you get to voice more ideas and anything that you would recommend, you know, to your fellow coaches, to, you know, your seniors, whatever, um, that could maybe, as we would say, activate diversity and improve the numbers in this area? Well, I think especially now, we've seen it, the social justice issues that the NBA has kind of, you know, backed, uh, whether from the ownership down to coaches, I think the Coaches Association has done a terrific job um, putting pushing this agenda, um, you know, bring it to the forefront. And we've seen it with the uh, the voting that's, uh, you know, during the election. And, and that's kind of been a, a thing the Coaches Association spearheaded, allowing the arenas um, and pushing for those arenas to be poll places and voting centers. Um, and, you know, I, I think just those little steps and I, even that, um, there are a lot of holes and red tape you have to go through. But even that, I think, is is something that kind of just opens the eyes of some of the decision makers and, and they realize how important this thing is. Um, but from a player standpoint, and, and I'll, I'll just 
make a blanket statement, and I don't know if I'm completely correct in that. I don't think many um, student athletes or, or professional athletes really think beyond their sport um, as, as far as what comes next. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a problem along, you know, professional sports in general. It's not a, and it's just an exposure issue. If you haven't been exposed to anything and you've, you've just played, you know, the, the bulk of your life, you've kind of um, honed in on this one area and all of your attention and energy has gone into this one thing. What happens when that one thing ends? So it's not just, you know, I think an NBA issue. I think it's just a, a, an issue that we've seen throughout professional sports. Are there any mentoring programs? I mean, could I think about it? And I bring that up because within the military, I'm a retired Jack. That's a big thing they're talking about right now to try to help improve diversity where, you know, different officers, whether they're white or black, are trying to mentor people of color, women, et cetera, so that mm -hmm. maybe they get that exposure. Is there anything like that in the NBA? I mean, you talked about the program before, but have there, how deep does that go? I guess, does that happen? Or it's, is it kind of- Oh, no, it more? definitely happens. And I think, okay. you know, I think once players identify that, you know, there, there's interest, I think they're really fast-tracked, which I think is great. You know, you okay. see former players who, um, you know, kind of move into the front office role, and then within, you know, five to seven years, they're right on the cusp of, of being, you know, assistant GM, GM, you know, maybe president, certainly not enough of them, but the, the ones that I've, that I've seen, it's, it's, they've been fast tracked because I think their experience as players gives them a different perspective. Okay. It's, it's more fine tuned than someone who's never really been in the trenches and played the game. And it's funny you bring up players. There was a controversy earlier on in summer uh, about certain hirings, and, and one of the controversies was that, you know, they hired a former ball player who was a Hall of Famer superstar himself. But they were looking at, again, the numbers like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. there's plenty of black coaches like yourself who are capable, willing, ready and able, as well as women. I don't want to leave women mm -hmm. out of this who are mm -hmm. able to step into this, these positions. And, you know, they hired this particular individual. And a lot of people were saying, you know, it's not about that individual. And I think that's that's actually the truth. I think that person mm -hmm. is probably more than qualified. But. How does that play in to go back to kind of the, that fit question? Because a lot of people wrestle with, well, you could always argue they're not the right fit. And some that could be code word for it because they're they're a man or they're mm -hmm. a woman or they're, you know, not this or not that. So to go beyond that, what could we do if anything, you know, again from the outside or even internally within the league to, to make sure fit is not used as a code word or an excuse for not hiring women, people of color, whatever it may be, into some of these positions. Is there anything that you can think of? And maybe, Cam, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, so sorry about that. Right. But is there anything you could see, whether it's a matter of maybe you have a checklist of criteria that aren't, you know, they're not necessarily race-based or, or female-based or whatever, but just says you need to have these criteria to even be considered for a job. Would something like that help or some other type of, you know, program? Well, it's tough to say, well, there has to be certain criteria. I think as a former player, you're going to check most of those boxes, you know, and, and especially, you know, player – of that caliber, you know, in that particular instance. Uh, but it, it's just difficult because I think once again, it's a relationship based and there are situations where you may feel even overqualified, not necessarily for a head coaching job, but for another position in an organization, mm -hmm. but because of a previous relate working relationship or, um, you know, you had, you went to school with somebody. So it, I think it's no different than any other industry in, in this business. You know, you, you could say, well, nepotism. Well, I'm a benefactor of nepotism. My father worked in the NBA. Mm -hmm. The team that he worked for gave him the leverage to hire me as a an intern. And thankfully, you know, because of him, uh, my work ethic gave me the opportunity to to stay in the business. Uh, but my end was certainly relationship based. <laughs> so, but you staying there was based on your hard work. I mean, that's agreed. Agreed. And I think that's what, what you know. In the NBA, I'll, you know, and, I'll, and I'll just preface that, I think that's more aligned to the things we've seen. You know, I think that we've seen ebbs and flows with the number of minority candidates getting head jobs. Um, and, you know, I think right now there's seven or eight, I think six of which are African-American. Mm -hmm. uh, so out of 30 teams, it's not it's not great, but it, I think it's certainly surpasses some of the other you know professional sports leagues uh, as far as percentages. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where – I don't know if you can ever, you know, really define the word fit because I think it means different things to different people. Um, for one franchise, you know, and I'll just talk about my situation. They could argue, well, you know, why would we take a chance on a guy who has no experience? Well, there's no 
I, I have no retort for that. I don't have any head coaching experience. I have 23 years of experience in this business. I think um, I'm more, more than qualified and ready, but someone's going to have to be willing to take a chance. And I don't think that has anything to do with race. It's just if you're, you know, whether ownership or front office management and you're making a decision on the future of your franchise, it's easy and safe to say, well, I want to go with a proven um, commodity versus take a chance on a young guy who we have no idea how this will work in this environment. And, and I think that's that's right in a lot of ways. But again, that goes back to and, and maybe the experience. Does, does a player kind of outshine or account for experience? Because there are players who have been hired into leadership positions who weren't coaches of any level or scouts of any level. So is there a balance there that, okay, well, you've played, particularly if you were a great player, that mm-hmm. kind of sub- is a substitute for somebody who's been in the league for 23 years? And again, I don't know if that's a question you can really answer, but that is something I think that a lot of people are looking at. Like, we hear that, but we also are seeing, well, wait a minute, there are seem to be, I think exceptions is too strong of a word, but there seems to be mm-hmm. something that allows others to go through and others that can't. Um, and, you know, and I think, I think you have to look, once again, you have to look at the broader spectrum. And at, once there's so many layers to that relationship, whether it's a relationship to the GM, where in some cases they may have been teammates. Right. Um, okay. or, so it's, it's, it's so many different dynamics that go into play. It's hard to say, hey, th- this one thing, this one key indicator is the reason why or why not someone gets an opportunity and someone doesn't. What can we do as, as lawyers or as average citizens do to help affect change in this area. Now, I would submit to you, maybe we do things like look at our congressional leaders, all right? We just came through this whole election process. You talked about the voting Ooh. issues, right? the stadiums being used. Is it as simple as we reaching out to our local councilmen, governors, states, people, whatever it may be, and say, hey, look, this is an issue that we need to get involved in as a, as a citizen. If, you, if, you're, if you have a stadium in the state of Maryland, then we should have some say in terms of who's representing the community in terms of their leadership is it as simple as that. Uh, is it, you know, protesting is a big thing right now. Is it protesting maybe, uh, is there anything else or is it maybe a combination of those things? What do you see if you have an opinion on that, what we can do uh, as just the average person, you know, maybe don't buy tickets or buy more tickets for certain organizations because they seem to be progressive and, and, and diversified. How do you see that from, from your standpoint? Well, I think the conversation has to be had and I don't think it's, you know, you go from, consumers to 180 degree shift and all of a sudden protest. But I think there, there there's a spectrum there where um, you can have conversations with local leaders and, you know, franchise ownership uh, just to kind of gauge, you know, wh- where are we on some of these issues? Um, see how they uh, react to the social justice issues that are, you know, on full display right now in this country. You know, what is their response to that? Uh, so I think you can kind of look at certain things, um, dig a little deeper in their own background and see, you know, where, where, how do they react to these situations? Um, and I think that'll, it's, it's telling, um, and you can't necessarily hold them, their feet to the fire because they're also business people. And we all know, you know, money drives this whole thing. So, you know, yes, you can affect the bottom line by not, you know, coming to events or not, um, you know, using the facilities in some way or some form, but I think you have to kind of do a little homework first before you just say, you know what, this is our stance, take it or leave it um, as consumers. Thank you for that. So Tracy, let's talk to you for a minute. Now we've heard from a coach, we've heard from a legal officer in the NBA Let's talk a little bit about the, the other positions, the, the people that represent some of these players and some of these maybe front office people. Um, first question I have for you is that minority owned sports agencies, for example, the owners of Sports Entertainment Group, TLS, uh, a talent agency, Clutch Sports, which is owned by or, or uh, connected with, I should say, LeBron James and Rich Paul and Rock Nation, which is owned by Jay-Z are becoming more popular and relevant in professional sports today. In your experience, how has more diverse representation helped players during their playing years and when they retire? And then has the, this diversity allowed players to make take more leadership, have more control in their respective sports organizations? Well, thank you. First of all, um, Jamie, thank you so much for that question. But I'd like to first thank this division of the ABA 
the solo and small firm and general practice division and its chairwoman, um, Coward. So thank you so much for having us here today. With regards to your question, it makes all the difference in the world. First of all, some of our leading uh, black owned agents are the biggest uh, proponents of athletes from historically black colleges. Now you mentioned that earlier on and I must give a shout out to Spelman College, which is my alma mater. And um, so with all my Morehouse brothers and my, and my Howard sisters, uh, we're all here together. And so many of our black agencies uh, pick from historically black colleges, unlike many of our agents that have three letters, I won't name names, that uh, typically go to universities that are well known, uh, that our top draft picks come from, but they oftentimes leave behind historically black colleges. So I'll start there. It broadens the pool and it benefits our, meaning our collective sons and daughters coming from historically black colleges given the, based on the given sport. Secondarily, those agencies, the black agencies or minority owned agencies also have a very vested interest in helping the players, not like the others don't, but because they've been there, they've started their own agencies. So they wanna in turn pass on the same knowledge. And what I've seen is that it's been a, a, a direct correlation. Hey, I, for lack of a better phrase, learned how to get my hustle on, i.e. I've got my own agency. So I'm going to now help you the athlete um, have an alternative stream of income so that playing on the gridiron, on the basketball court, boxing in the ring or playing on ice is not your only stream of income. And we want you to think about it now as you sit in the chair as a very top tiered athlete and also on your arc. Because when I think of a player's trajectory in their, in their career, I, I do a kind of a half moon. I say they're on their way up and then they're here and they're peaking. And when they're peaking, they're often not thinking about the fact that an arc is gonna also have a downturn. So that's the retirement piece. And I have found that many of my clients have a little bit of short-sightedness until they have someone pulling out their coattail and saying, hey, what are you gonna do in the next 10 years? They're talking about 10 years, I'm good. Well, okay, um, but let's think about this. And so they start, uh, giving them all alternate um, avenues to pursue income, um, accelerator programs, esports. I mean, you can pick one. Right now, influencers, uh, we don't want you to be wed to the NFL, the NBA, your given teams as your only method to bring in income. Because as we know, many a career has been short sighted um, based on potential injury, career ending injuries and many others in between. So I find that black agencies and others, minority agencies have been extremely beneficial to the players and will continue to help feed our pipeline of our players from historically black colleges and other colleges and universities that may not be feeder institutions instinctively. What about, let's contemplate this. Now the Rooney Rule, since it's been instituted, only one organization has been fine for violating it, all right? How can this rule incorporate more stringent aspects or requirements, whether it's in regard to recruiting, interviewing, uh, filing grievances uh, for those candidates that are slighted? Well, seeing that I am representing uh, players typically and not, um, well, I'm gonna come from two perspectives. From the player's perspective, it would be very helpful to have the tone at the top um, speaking down and saying, hey, I need to see more people that are in the front office so that they can help me, so that they can understand my life, so that I don't just come to the team, although I'm very happy to have a job and to be playing um, in professional sports is a blessing. Um, they also want to know that they've got someone that's got their ear. So the players need to have more front office C-suite members of color, as well as the organization. So then that, that's from the top down. So we need our owners to believe that if I don't have the numbers, then I'm doing something wrong because then my players don't have, my players and my intermediary exec, executives don't have anyone 
that looks like them. And then there'll be a breakdown in communication, a breakdown in morale, and it's a trickle down. You know, we're, they're no longer, or they're, this is not an, a world of indentured servants, just because we're playing for a large, um, for a major sports league team or organization. Everyone wants to feel like they matter and that their voices are heard. And so I believe that as far as the Rooney rule goes, like D'Amica spoke earlier, it's not about the number. Yeah, we have one person that has to be interviewed. Great, because the person inside typically knows who they want to hire, as David referenced. And I believe Wes even um, just made that mention. So I do believe that it's a top-down remedy. Let, let's, let's be blunt and honest for a minute. All right, so we, we've talked about owners. And to me, it's kind of the elephant in the room a little bit. So we're talking about diversity. We're talking about hiring more women, more people of color, more whatever you want to put behind that. Will it really make a difference in terms of diversity you know, in the C-suite if we don't change the ownership or maybe some other things? And if not, then you know, how do we do it? How do we go about that? You said we're going to speak frankly, right? OK, yeah, so let's do it. Let's do it. Right. And blank walks. Just bottom line. So I don't know how many owners we've got in the house, but um, D'Amica mentioned Arthur Blank. She mentioned Jerry Jones. And we could, you know, the Wilfs here in Minnesota. And many of them are very well intentioned and good people. In fact, I went to law school with one of the Wilfs. That's another story. My point is, is that it, it, the owners um, have to have to care about it. And so I don't know, unless we've got the financial wherewithal, unless we are gonna actually start owning. So I think we've got a better chance, frankly, if we wanna go there um, with and the NBA. I think we're closer to ownership with the NBA. I think we've seen some owners in the NBA. If we wanna talk about um, things that happened in Charlotte back in the day. Um, so money is going to be something that will help rule the direction that we, uh, go in as far as really pushing this initiative. Again, does it matter? Of course it matters. No one wants to be the only one in the room. This is 2020. And so the power that we have um, with our numbers, as we saw um, this year with the Black Lives Matter movement and what took place with the NBA was just one example of, of, of power and numbers. And so we don't have the owners right now, but we do have the numbers. And so I think that we need to continue to push and um, push gently, but push and apply the pressure because we do see that we will get results. I have one more question for you. Actually, I have a bunch more, but we're gonna stick with one for now because of timing. What recommendations, I hope we have some young lawyers, young professionals watching this tonight. Uh, what recommendations do you have for young lawyers or new lawyers in terms of diversity who want to enter this field? What, what advice would you give to them? To seek mentors to seek sponsors, to be intentional about when I say mentorship. That's one, I see sponsorship, I see another. Sponsorship means someone that will speak on your behalf when you're not in the room. Mentorship will help open doors for you and someone that is someone that you can em emulate. Um, find those people, we've got enough of them. Some of us are on the call right now. Um, hit us up, reach out as well. Be excellent in your craft. Certainly no one's gonna do you any favors if you haven't handled the baseline qualifications. You know, the floor is excellence. And so knowing that and crossing all of your T's and dotting all of your I's so that we don't have to circle back and make excuses for anyone. We've already crossed every hurdle that's needed. Now give me my shot because I'm, I'm already supposed to be here. So I, 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 my recommendation is to always know that excellence is the criteria and also find those, because there are plenty of us to support each other. Find your local organizations, your local bar associations for long, young lawyers. Um, become members of the National Bar Association, NBA, um, uh, you know, divisions that, that might be more specific to your interests. MCCA, BISLA, I could go on and on, but find those that will help bring you up and then make sure that when you're there, you drop your hand down to help the next person. Tracy, thank you. To you young lawyers, if you heard it right, you heard an invite there, all right? So take advantage of this opportunity to the panel members as well as others um, that, so we can improve that, that, that pipeline. 
Uh, at this time, I'd like to move on. Thank you, Tracy. Move on to Mr. Gomes. Hello, how are you? How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Doing great. Good. So let's hit a few questions. And then, you know, you and I have had a little discussion before, so we might get a little deep later on for the group. But let's start kind of soft in the beginning. Um, right. When you played in a major league, did you see any minorities, you know, making decisions? Were they managers? Were they in the front office well, or, or any senior position? Great question. And, and I, like, I, like I spoke earlier, um, when I was playing, I was in my early 20s um, and I was completely uh, had laser focus on making it to the big leagues, staying in the big leagues and being great in the big leagues and anything else around me, I was kind of oblivious to. Um, so looking, to, taking a step back and after you asked the question, I would have to say no. OK, but at the time, um, you know, coaches, front office people had no, I never felt like they had no impact on me, uh, impact on me. It was, it was like, I'm going to be in control of my own destiny. So, which is, can be true and it can be not, not, not so true. Um, but I didn't, I didn't look at it at the time. I didn't look at the time. I look at it now, um, being more mature and taking a step back and, and being more of a fan. Um, but at the time I didn't pay attention, but there were, there was none or very limited. We talked previously, you, you kind of told a story about a relationship that you have, and I don't want to put any names out there or anything like that, but could right. you tell us about that story? I think it's important. Yeah. Well, um, our minor league coordinator um, was an was a old, older white male, and he had a son who was drafted by the team I was on, was, on, was, was with the Phillies, and we were in double A together. <clears throat> And we became really good friends. We were, we were, we were really cool. Um, it just so happened that his father was the big boss. Um, now, minor league coordinator in, in, in our major league team is, is, a, is a pretty big deal. That's a, that's a pretty heavy job. Um, so as we became friends, you know, um, I mean, he had a sister that would come in from time to time. And his sister was, was, was our age, and she was fairly attractive. Um, so, you know, we would, we would rib ribbon of all time, you know, about having a pretty sister and so forth, you know, just friendly ribbon, nothing, nothing personal or nothing, you know, just giving a hard time. Well, we played together a couple of years and his sister got married and his sister married a, a black man from, I think he, he might've played for the Cardinals, but it, she married a black man. So I, I felt comfortable enough to, to joke him about it and, you know, and just, Hey man, what's dad think about that? And, you know, he kind of, he kind of told me, you know, hey, you know, I, I just looked straight up and my, my dad's not very fond of black people. And, you know, he's not, um, he's just, he's, he's kind of a racist, you know, and I love my father, but, you know, he's, he's kind of a, he's kind of a racist. Let's just call it what it is. Now, it's not something he spread with the whole organization, obviously. Um, he shared with me because we, we remain, you know, we, we, we developed some kind of type of bond. Um, however, I didn't think much of it then because, I, didn't, I never thought his father had too much of an impact on my career anyway, because I, I, I was going to make it or I'm not going to make it. And he, he wasn't going to be, you know, the reason why I did or didn't make it. Um, however, you know, looking back, you know, that that's a problem. You know, that's a problem because he had a lot of he had a lot of say over fringe players, players who could make it or who couldn't make it, um, whether they get the chance to come back. And you have somebody in that role who isn't familiar with people or doesn't care for people who doesn't, who don't look like him. I mean, just call it what it is. Um, so, um, um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the nuts of the story. Let's take a little further. So you were a successful ball player. You were in that higher echelon uh, of, of, of ball players towards in your career, after all your accolades, all the experience you had, what programs were offered to you or what advice were you given to assist you in your transition? to go into that front office? Did you get anything as a superstar player? Um, absolutely zero. Uh, and, but, but I don't want to put that on any team or organization. Here's the reason why. When you're playing, um, you, are, you are looking to take it to the next level. And any, at any point when you let your mind off the hook and say, hey, man, let's start planning for uh, front office front office or planning for life after baseball, to me, it would seem like I'm, I'm just a little bit letting my guard down and looking for something else when I can be putting all my focus in the plane. So that's the mindset. That, that's the mindset of players. Um, look, I, I, I'm not thinking about, you know, 
my next career. I focused my these last 20 years on this career. And when it's gone, it's gone. And it's, it, it's a shock. It, it is a shock going from um, being in the field and playing. And all of a sudden they say, hey, come here. Uh, you're not good enough. Uh, uh, you, you have to go home now. We don't have a job for you anymore. So that's 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 very difficult. And I've, I've had a lot of friends who who struggled really, really bad making a transition. Um, they made a lot of money and you know, you go from making a, mil to a million or $5 million to, to zero. I mean, um, your agent isn't, isn't holding your hand anymore because you, you're pretty much no more good to him because you're not making that, he's not making that commission. So, um, you know, I don't want to focus. I don't, I don't want to put that responsibility on the teams. Now it would be, it would be a good idea to present that to the players because some people might you know, take it on. I, I, I'll be honest. Um, I probably wouldn't have. Um, because again, my whole focus was getting to the major leagues, staying in the major leagues, being great in the major leagues, and and staying here as long as I can. I never, I never envisioned it not being there. But however, you know, I'm, I was 25, 30, 25, 27 years old. You know, uh, you know, you don't have the the foresight, you know, at that age as I do now at at, at 47. So, so is it fair to say that the the Wayne Gomes pitcher? Mm -hmm. Back in the day, versus the Wayne Gomes now, you were afraid or chose not to upset upset the apple cart, cart so to speak. Is that, is that a fair statement, or is it just because you were so focused? Um, I would say I would say I, I didn't I didn't up, like to upset the apple cart, but I don't understand how that. Help me out now. You, you said upset the so so, so, so the, the, let's, let's go back and, and then maybe I skipped a little. I skipped a step here. All right. Let's talk about today's time. Let, let's go back. I'll come back to that question in a minute. Okay. All right. Black Lives Matter. All right. All right. And player activism, as as we've seen it today. Correct. Uh, particularly when you look at Colin Kaepernick and and kneeling. All right. Correct. If you were playing today. Would you stand or would you kneel? Okay, good question. And I, um, um, I, I thought about this a lot. And I know my answer is not going to be popular, um, but I'm going to stick by it. And my answer is I would stand. Uh, I would stand. <clears throat> um, it's not because I don't believe Black Lives Matter. It's not because I don't believe in what Colin Cap, Colin Cap stand for, because I, I, I do. I completely do. I also understand that that flag to me, to me, doesn't, rep doesn't necessarily represent the military, it, but it also doesn't ne necessarily re represent uh, pr pr police brutality either. It, it, it represents a, a, a lot of things, many of things. And my choice will be to stand. And here's a reason, here's one another reason why. I have played and I've been in a lot of other places. Um, I played baseball in Venezuela. I played baseball in Puerto Rico. I played baseball in Dominican. Uh, and um, what we have in this country is, is, a, is a pretty good thing. And, and I'm proud to be from this country. Um, um, so so um, we have our problems. Most certainly we do. Um, but we have a good thing going and, and this is where I'm from. And I, 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 ch I would choose to, to stand. It might not be unpopular, um, um, but, my, but that would not be in a reflection of what the next man decides to do because he might have his own certain reasons and he, and he has his own sorts of, sorts of beliefs. And that's one thing that makes this country so great that we can, we, we can agree or disagree and we can, we can have, you, can, you can express your own opinion. So just so I'm clear and, and you know, full disclosure, uh, I'm a retired Army JAG, I'm a combat veteran. And so for me, yes, I'm always going to stand, but that's because I'm a third time combat, third generation combat uh, soldier. I, you know, the flag is something that's, that's always been in me and I'm just going to do it. However, I truly believe that I fought wars so that people had a decision. And so just so I'm clear, if your teammates were to kneel, would you have any issues with that? No, no, no I would have no issue at all. No, I, and I, I think I, I think I, I, I thought I tried to make that clear. I would have no issue at all. No, none at all. Okay. No, no. No. So let's go on. And what about those who would say that, look, you're a big time baseball player. All right. You have responsibilities, particularly as a player of color, to speak up, to speak power to truth. All right. Those who would criticize your, your, your last comment, mm -hmm. um, 
what would you say to him? Is it is it a simple, you know, is it that simple that if you're a big time player or maybe an average player, you should speak up when you see something wrong? Well, well, well first of all, n- right. nailing nailing does not mean I'm I'm not speaking up. Okay, um, I mean, fair. So so uh, so let's just I I I have made a I have made a pack with myself that I'm 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 going to speak up and speak out. Okay, and offer any everybody an opportunity that 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 I can give an opportunity to, and. And next, um, I never considered, and I appreciate, I, I'm humbled by, by how you describe my career, but I never considered myself a, a big time player. So, so and, and that matters. I know we'll get to that, to that later. I mean, so I mean, we had the conversation earlier. Um, you know, we talk about the Dallas Cowboys and Jerry Jones said, you know, all my players are going to stand. Well, okay, you think so. You know, but, but if, if Dak Prescott decides to kneel, the Cowboys, I mean, he's going to kneel and he's going to start and he's going to play. And and he, Jerry Jones is going to have to be upset. I mean, that's just how it is. He's not going to be bitched and he's going to have a career. He has guaranteed money and nothing's going to happen to him. On the flip side, if the backup long snapper decides to kneel when the rest of the team stands, that backup long snapper is going to be out of a job. I mean, I mean that's just, just, just facts. So there are different levels to this. And I don't knock either one because that black up long snapper has, has a family and children to feed. And, and if he doesn't feel like this is the platform that works for him, then I don't, I don't think he should be ostracized. I, 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 I don't. I don't. That's an individual individual decision. OK. And I'm, I'm going to switch gears a little bit because our diversity discussion has primarily been about race and, and, and gender. Uh, you, you also share with us a, a personal story about your son when we had our pre-meeting and kind of I want to talk about, you know, not everybody's going to be. And, and I do consider you to be a superstar. I think you did pretty well for your time in the league. Well, thank you. Uh, not everybody's going to be that person. So what's there for them? And, and tell the, the audience about your, your son a little bit, if you don't mind. In particular, what his, 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 how he was born or, or? Yeah, well, just the fact that he had a, a disability. Yeah, yeah my, son and, was and, born, my son was born right in the middle of the season. He was born with um, childhood glaucoma. He was born blind. Um, um, he, he had about while well, he was in Philadelphia. He had about five or six surgeries. In the last surgery, they told told us he, the exact words were: "With a cornea transplant, he may be one day able to see big letters." But on the way out the door, he gave me a card for a guy named Dr. Walton in Boston. So we went to Dr. Walton in Boston. We I called Dr. Walton. Um, he returned my phone call the day after the Labor Day, and I told him the condition he had, what his pressures were looking like. And he said, get him up here. We, we raced him up there. And Dr. Walton saw my son and says, hey, look, um, I can help you. However, he can never, ever see another doctor ever again. You know, he, I, he had to be under my care. So the Phillies gave me some time off. Um, Miles immediately went into surgery. Um, he didn't get cornea transplant. Uh, he, he, uh, he had a few, some tubes put in his eyes. He is doing great now he sees he drives he lives the function of a normal boy he sucks as a baseball player um um but um but uh he's a great kid he, like i said he's a, he's a, he's at hampton he's a junior he's flourishing and he's, he's lived a normal life i mean um um I, I there's some opportunities i wanted to offer him or i or i told him you know, he's, a, he's a he's a baseball fan he watched me play you know as a child um he he would he would never i saw from a long time he would never ever be able to be that be a be a baseball player. So I said I gave him some option. I said, "Hey man, you like baseball? I would say I would try scouting. Um, I, I think there's a there's a market for if you learned a foreign language, specifically not Chinese, um, or if you you would be an, like an international scout. He didn't do it, um, but I thought that would be a good avenue for him. Um, but um, I, I did introduce it to him. So and to and the purpose of that story is really I want to talk about the options real quickly. The options that that maybe the stars don't have that, you know, you can maybe introduce you, you teach a baseball Academy. What would you say to those persons out there that want to get into the front office? Um, but maybe they want to be the superstar, but they really just can't be, what can they do? What do you teach your kids in your Academy or what well, would you like to teach them? Well, well, first of all, I, I give them, <sighs> I paint the whole picture for them. Um, that, that the, the chances of you making it to the big leagues and I hate to hurt your feelings, man. Okay. I know you're good. You're good at 13 or 14. Um, but the chances of making the big leagues are, are almost like the chances of hitting the lottery. I mean, so, so they, they aren't they're, they're aren't in your favor. You know, there's a ton of guys, and there's a ton of guys that, that are that are real, that are really good. 
um, at high school level, at the college level, in the minor league level. You know, it's a lot of steps to it. So um, um, come up with another plan here in, in case this big league thing doesn't work. And it's first of all, it's always, always education. Um, but, you know, I, I tell them there's, there's, diff there's different avenues, you know, to get in the major league baseball realm just besides, besides, um, besides playing, you know, there's coaching, there's scouting, um, there's front office. I mean, I mean, but that, at front office, that, that always comes with a level of education and, and being able to, to know more uh, about the game than being able to just to play it. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Gomes. Hopefully we'll get back to you a little later on. All right. Turn it over to my brother, Mr. Abram. All right. Thank you so much, Jamie. And thanks a lot for uh, that interview, uh, Mr. Gomes. Uh, last but definitely not least, we have Mr. Brian Baptiste. Thank you for being so patient with us, Mr. Baptiste, as well as everybody else um, who are still attending. Um, so let's get it started. Uh, you were a facilities uh, admin and plan construction. Do you think we need to expand our concept of being sports executives and how to get to a hot to higher positions? Um, compliance should, we should be examining um, in terms of compliance, more roles. What type of roles do you think that we should be looking into um, kind of along what you were doing? Yeah, I appreciate uh, you having me th this evening and, and all the panelists were, were exceptional. Uh, yeah, I think for me, it was really about how do you diversify your portfolio and give yourself experiences where when you want to be able to sit into the athletic director chair, you're able to check a lot of those boxes because you've had those experiences. I think, you know, I started my career out in, in compliance, um, athletic compliance specifically, and it really allowed me to be able to learn a lot about the different areas within the, the NCAA landscape. I mean, because you're directly dealing with all sorts of issues, whether it's coaches, whether it's student athletes, whether it's the, the marketing department, whether it's, it's donors. Um, and then the opportunity came about to be able to oversee uh, a construction project and, and multiple construction projects. And when you think about you know, that, that transition, it was really thinking, oh, well, how do you make sure you don't get pigeonholed as the compliance person, right? And, and often that happens to a lot of us in college athletics. You get pigeonholed and then you're the compliance person. You're the academic support person, right? You don't get the opportunity to be able to get a lot of other experiences. And, and, and the, facility, um, the facility piece was great because now you think about, well, you're working with local and state and federal government, you know, as it relates to permitting, right? You're, you're doing um, some revenue generating opportunities when you're thinking about how do you design these facilities where you can bring in more revenue from an institutional perspective. You think about um, the interaction that you have with donors, right? Because the opportunity to be able to, to provide and generate additional resources for your institution to support student athletes. And so for me, it was about being able to have all of those opportunities that were different so when I had the ability to get in front of a, a search firm and to get in front of a president and to have questions about how did you make sure that you're providing a, a full experience for student athletes and being able to create an environment and a culture for an athletic department to allow uh, those student athletes to have success, you're, you have the opportunity to, to, to really go back and say, here are experiences that I could directly speak to that are diverse. And I think if we have the opportunity to look at different things and and I didn't have, I don't have an architectural background. I didn't have a, a construction background, but it was the ability to do something different and, and, and expand, um, you know, you know, my base and, and, and reach and, and challenge myself a little bit. And, and if we're okay to challenge ourselves, right. And if we're okay to realize that we can hold ourselves into a box, which people like to do, then it will provide us other opportunities. And so I, I always encourage, you know, individuals that, um, whether it's, you know, they're in compliance now and they want to be able to figure out, well, how do I get out of compliance and do something different, right? Look at other opportunities. And then if you have the ability to engage in various aspects on um, in a department to say, well, on a Saturday, maybe I should do some marketing in a football game because I could speak to that, even if I am a a, a academic support um, uh, uh, personnel, or maybe I should uh, find opportunities to you know, help in the community. So I can say that I'm, I'm engaged in with, with, those, with that constituent groups as well too. So any opportunity you have to sort of diversify yourself, I just think it makes you more marketable. Um, and, and when you're trying to get in front of those decision makers and, and from a college athletic standpoint, 
if you want to be an athletic director, it's a president, right? And you have to be able to speak to, to all of those experiences to allow them to show that you have the, the opportunity and, and the ability to, to, to make those decisions and, and really lead a department. Okay, thank you for that. Um, you are part of what's called the Atlantic 10 Commission on Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. Could you please give us a snippet about what that organization is about? And um, can you give us a take on um, how they are effectively addressing the issues we're talking about today in regards to the Rooney Rule? Yeah, so it, it's a, a newly created commission uh, within our conference. I'm really pleased to be able to, to co-chair uh, that commission along with the president uh, of Duquesne. And it's really an opportunity to leverage the 14 member institutions that we have within the A10. When you think about our communities and where we serve, so whether that's from Massachusetts to Virginia to St. Louis to Dayton, Ohio, right? And, and we have subject matter experts within our campus community. And it's really about not just looking at athletics, but using athletics as an opportunity to really speak to some of these issues, right? We, we know that from a professional uh, athletic standpoint that we have um, athletes that really want to use their voice, but the same thing is happening on, on a college campus, right? And you think about, you know, these are really important years for young people, whether they're 18 to 23, and they're trying to find themselves. And so if we can put together programming that would allow not just student athletes, but any student on the campus. So maybe they decide that they want to be a community organizer. Maybe they decide that they want to, to go to law school and they want to be a lawyer or they want to ascend to, to be a judge and really help effectuate some of the change. Or maybe they want to get into the, the political realm as well too. So we're trying to be able to do all those things and create opportunities to, to, to really you know, bring about change. So we, we look at, at you know, education and training. And so how do we put together programming to at least um, have things on our college campuses, right, to be able to talk about some of those issues and, and educate folks, right? We're thinking about how do we look at policies and procedures when we, you talk about hiring, right? And, and you look at, you know, the West Coast Conference, they, they created the, the Bill Russell rule, right? Similar to the Rooney rule on the collegiate side. So is there an opportunity for us to do something similar um, within the A-10? I think it's important to, to assess some of the things that were happening on our campus. So let's say we have, 10 out of our 14 schools are doing a, part a particular piece of programming. Well, can we do that collectively at, at the, with all 14 institutions and really leverage the strength of, of our membership? And so we're looking at all those pieces um, and we're, you know, we're just in the infancy. We, we created it this year, obviously with, with a lot of the, the social um, unrest and, 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 and civil unrest and social injustices that were happening um, th this summer. But I think it's a tremendous opportunity for us to, to continue to to grow and do something meaningful, but also do it from a unified front and make sure it's also sustainable as well too, um, because we're seeing it, you know, within our population that we deal with every day, like they're, they're active and they're engaged and, and they want to really make a difference. So um, I, I'm excited about the possibilities and I'm just humbled to be able to, to, to be part of the commission. And, and, and the other thing that we did that was really important when we put together the group um, each institution has three members. And so, you know, one member is a, 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 an administrator. So that could be a president, it could be an athletic director, um, it could be a, a coach. Um, we also wanted to make sure that one of the individuals was a, a current or a former student athlete so we can hear their perspective because that's really important. And then we also thought that it was critical to have a subject matter expert. So it could be a diversity officer on your campus or it could be somebody that's in your alumni um, base that really, it, you know, they're working on those issues right now um, in their field. So, you know, we just really thought it was important to have a real diverse perspective to be able to, to bring about um, some, some meaningful change. Oh, fantastic. So um, we know that this type of group is not the first. Um, we've been trying to address issues of race and gender for a while now. We have issues such as the students who are boycotting it in Mizzou in order to get their president removed because of some things that were happening with racism on campus. We had the recent firing of the University of Minnesota football coach um, due to some things that his students were doing and that he was uh, putting a blind eye to. Um, we've had things like that happening across the country. We had D1 basketball students who are now going to HBCUs because of some of the uh, racism and things like that they're experiencing um, on the campus. How would you suggest other affinity groups like the Atlantic team and Black 80 Alliance go from being figurehead organizations to impactful groups? 
Yeah, so I, you know, I think we we sort of use this phrase, um, you know, it's it's going beyond the words and into action, right? And and so like that's really important to to actually do things that are going to bring about um, change, you know, within the community. I think we're seeing that our student athletes realize like they have that they're empowered, right? And they want to be able to make an impact, and they're doing and and they're realizing that not only from the time that they arrive on our campus, but before they arrive on our campus, because now we're now seeing a trend of high profile prospective student athletes that are deciding to go to HBCUs, right? Because they feel like they wanna be able to, to, to make a difference and they have the same opportunity and support that they can get at a, at a predominantly white um, you know, institution as well too. So I think, you know, it's, it's, it's about that piece, right? But it's also about creating strategic alliances that we can actually bring about you know, some of those impactful for moments, you know, when we think about the black AD alliance, you know, the things that we talk about, and we have various task forces. So whether it's a pipeline, how do you create a pipeline, right? How do you, um, if you're a student athlete, and you never, you know, thought about being an athletic director, well, now you can look at the black AD alliance and see 50 plus other athletic directors on the division one level that have done it, right? So now you see that as a possibility for you. And so how do we create that pipeline for, for them to be able to get into those various areas and give them an opportunity uh, you know, for growth and, and development, right? We think about alliances. How do we have those strategic, strategic alliances within college athletics? So whether that um, our presidents that wanna support what we are, are doing, whether there are other athletic directors that don't necessarily look like us, that when there are opportunities, whether it's a deputy AD or associate AD, that they do give opportunities for people of color to be able to have those roles because I could pick up the phone and call someone and say, you should take a really strong look at this individual because they're qualified. And let me speak to, you know, be, let me speak to, to, to their characteristics and their attributes and, and the reason why they would provide, you know, great value to, 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 to your department. So I think those, those pieces um, are really important. How do we work with other organizations, whether it's, it's, it's MOA or whether it's with the NCAA to create programming that can really help individuals develop? Like I'm, I'm a product of a lot of NCAA programming um, specifically for, for minority professionals, right? That have allowed me to be able to, to do some, you know, communication media training, right? Or to be in front of search firms to do mock interviews. And so how do we create those opportunities in an intentional way to, to allow for um, the next generation, right? To continue to see the numbers change. Because when you look at, you know, we're in 2020 right now in, in 1985, right? Like the numbers aren't that drastically different from a percentage standpoint. So we have to find ways to, to utilize this moment where we have some leverage, right? Where people are thinking about it to continue to push it forward. And, and that's what we're trying to do um, you know, with the Black AD Alliance. And that's what we're also trying to do with, with the, the Atlantic 10 Commission. And you can see around college athletics, whether it's the ACC or the Big 10, you know, there are a bunch of other um, you know, organizations that are trying to make sure that diversity and inclusion and equity are at the forefront of their decision decision making and it's not just words right it's actually actions that they're that, that they're going about um, to bring about change okay and the final question I have for you uh Brian and this is a this is a big one so it got to be the last one so talking about student empowerment that that caught me that terminology um, college athletes are not paid however recent laws are now considering or allowing for allowing college players to have some control of their images and likeness, and essentially their branding, what effect, if any, would this assist in improving diversity in the C-suite and assist in player increasing young athletes' views towards executive rules after playing, after their playing time is over? So I think, you know, Tracy touched on this right earlier when she talked about um, you know, some of her clients and, and when they think about diversifying their revenue stream, right? Well, I think part of the reason why they may not necessarily be thinking about it because they didn't have the opportunity when they were college athletes. And so being able to create those opportunities now for them to think about, they could be like every other student, right? I mean, the, the reality is a student athlete doesn't have the ability to um, to start a business and use their name, image, and likeness based on the current rules, but another student on campus does have the ability to do that. And so I think 
that there are opportunities for, maybe you don't have that entrepreneurial spirit where you wanna create a business, right? Or you wanna run your own camp, but maybe you're thinking about from a, you're a marketing student, right? You're a marketing student and you're also a student athlete. Well, maybe you wanna help your, your, your peer um, help you know with their brand right and so now you start creating your own opportunities there right or maybe you decide that you you know you want to go into to the the legal realm and now it's an opportunity to make sure that the next generation of student athletes are protected and they're not being taken advantage of because they have the opportunity to to monetize their their name image and likeness you think about revenue generating opportunities right can you um, do something in your role as a student athlete now you're thinking about a different lens, right? You're, you're thinking about another opportunity that wasn't necessarily there because the rules um, sort of pigeonholed you and didn't give you the opportunity to, to sort of really flourish and, and provide, you know, the, and, and to provide the options to be able to do some of those things that, that a normal student can do. So I think when you look at all of the, um, the, the byproduct of, of the name, image, and likeness, like legislation, it will provide other opportunities that weren't, you know, weren't necessarily there for a, a huge population of, of influencers, right? Um, you know, whether it's, it's social media, they're, they're going to, they're going to need brand managers, they're going to need agents, they're going to need, um, you know, individuals that are, are helping them make sure that, you know, no one takes advantage of them, right? And so I think that's just another opportunity where, that cohort of individuals is now greater. Um, it, it, it isn't isolated to just when they become professional athletes, right? Now they'll they'll need that expertise when they're student athletes and they're on their campus right now. Thank you so very much, Brian. That was a that was a real deep perspective. I used to be a compliance officer at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, so I see a lot of uh, what what you're talking about in your speech. So that concludes um, our panelists um, individually. Uh, that is. And so now we have a Q&A session. All right. Kelly, are you taking over or Jane? Uh, no, I'm not taking over. But may I suggest that we go into our breakout rooms and then uh, let, let's go to Dan to, to introduce the breakout rooms and we can kind of put the questions with the people. I think that uh, match some of the questions with the panelists. Okay, well, this was a wonderful panel, and I, I'd like to thank all the panelists for spending your personal time with us. Um, when I called each of you individually, I know you thought I was crazy. First, some of you didn't know me, and those of you who did said, well, he's at it again. But um, thank you for joining us for the ride. Um, also, we'd like to thank our corporate sponsor, Thomas Reuters, for um, helping us with this program. And I want to give a little commercial plug while we're setting up the breakout rooms, because I understand we're having a little bit of technical difficulty. Um, January 21st, 2021, our next diversity series is going to happen is Pathways to Equal Justice. And this is going to be another dynamic program where we're going to have three individuals talk about their path of reforming of the criminal justice system. So you don't wanna miss that one. And it's gonna be very good, very exciting and very informative. And uh, it starts 5.30 p.m. Eastern time, 4.30 Central. For the breakout rooms, what we're doing is uh, we're going to have Tracy remaining in the big room. Uh, Brian and Wayne are gonna be put into a, a room of their own and Damika is gonna be in a room of her own. And what the concept is, so that we'll be able to get uh, up close and personal with them and be able to ask some additional questions. And I'm waiting on some guidelines from our technical people as to if we're ready to go with that at this point in time. And if we're not ready, they're gonna play a little music up. Oh, there we go, they're giving us directions so we can uh, join the breakout room so you Click join when prompted and look for your icons and go to the breakout rooms. You should see the little four dots and be able to go right into the breakout rooms. So let's see everybody in breakout rooms for the next 10 to 15 minutes or so. And then we'll come back and uh, have a final closeout. So I think we should be ready to, to hit the breakout rooms at this point. 
So the breakout rooms have launched. If you do not see one, I can assign one to you. Um, otherwise, if you see that icon that's on the screen, that's what you should be looking for. And I think we're all stuck, Kim. You're all stuck. Do you see the yeah. screen or no? Yeah, we see the screen, but we don't see the break. Okay. Let's see if it comes up. Okay. No, so we're not. Brian seeing Baptiste it. joined the room. So we yeah. got one person in one. <laughs> <laughs> I think Wayne and myself and Tracy and Aaron and D'Amica were and Jamie were all stuck. Kim, Kim, this is Jeff. I tried yeah. to do it and in the link didn't work. It didn't move me to a uh, breakout room. Okay. Um, this is Marianne. I couldn't move either. I pushed a button and it didn't move me. Welcome this is Chief, so neither could I. Welcome to my world. We'll just keep everybody here. We just go ahead and hit the questions and, and start chatting and having a reception and everything else. Well, first, you can't have a reception without refilling your drink. There you um, go. Right. Okay, this there is go. apple cider. <laughs> I just feel the need to say that, especially because of recording. And I'm driving home. And, uh, <laughs> and I have a reputation as well. So... Um, Tracy, while they're all trying to figure it out, I'd love to ask you a question. I, I love the fact that you gave a, um, a standard to those who are seeking mentorship. You know, you come with excellence. Because I know so many times you're like, you come fresh, you don't, you haven't, you haven't researched anything. You're just like, I just want you to be my mentor. And you're like, give me something to work with. <laughs> Can you kind of explain what you're looking for? Because people might actually reach out to you. And um, but, <laughs> we would like to know, what are you looking for, you know? Well, thank you for that. So um, Kelly, just this morning, for instance, I have, a, I have a mentor, I have a mentee rather that's here in Minnesota. He is going to be heading to the East Coast. He no longer wants to be in Minnesota, newsflash. He um, <laughs> was a great 1L, had a great position at a big law firm, very smart guy. And he decided he wants to go to DC, Philly, or New York because his family's in Maryland. So I called upon my Morehouse brother and he wanted to meet African-American men in law. What do I do? I hit up my, my folks and I, and I said, hey, before you, you know, I mean, it was like, if I'm introducing you to A. Scott, if I'm introducing you to Tony Pinder, if I'm introducing you to various major partners at major law firms in DC, or Mark Lee in, in Philly at Blank Rome or who, whoever I introduced him to, they need to have their stuff together. And so he did, he blew it out of the water. He was ready, his resume was tight, but I had him send me the resume first. I said, maybe you shouldn't say this like this. He was great. I said, what are you gonna say? Send it to me and he, you know, so, so he was prepped beyond prepped. So it made my job easier. He's got, he's got uh, follow-up calls with all of them. And, and that's, that's how he does that. Because again, it makes our job harder because we want to mentor and we want to sponsor. We want to be in the room when there's potential implicit bias. When someone's saying something, I, I can't help you one if I'm not in the room. So it's a blessing to have us in the positions to be in the room. But I want to be able to back it up with something that makes sense to me. Because if I've now heard that there's 45 typos in the brief, it's like, not 45, but two, four, five, because again, they're gonna focus on our five typos because there's only one of us in the room, opposed to a room of 45 majority law, law uh, students, uh, two L's, three L's, new lawyers, and but they're gonna focus on our one. So that's what I mean by help me by making my job as a mentor or sponsor easier, if that's helpful. Yeah, it is, thank you. Jamie, you have some questions? Yeah, just one, and, and either Tracy or, or Brian can answer this. We, what we kind of assumed was, you know, does diversity really matter? All right. Not everybody necessarily agrees with diversity. So can you talk about an example? And I think you kind of hit upon it a little earlier, um, but let's lay that out a little more. Does diversity matter? And can you give us an example of why it matters in your experience?
Did you want to go ahead, Brian? Uh, sure, I'll go. Um, I mean, I just think it's important, right? I think it's really important for, you know, um, just the dynamics of an organization and from a cultural standpoint and from a value standpoint to have diversity, to have diversity of, of experiences, to have diversity of, of, of opinions, right? Because what happens is if you don't, then you end up defaulting to what, you know, everyone else um, that potentially looks like you or, or maybe doesn't look like you. So you end up missing, you miss, you miss the boat in, in, in a major way. So like, that's why I think it's important to, um, but you have to work at it, right? So even from a, from a hiring standpoint, if you think that you're going to be able to have a diverse candidate pool just by posting something online, you're probably not going to get a diverse candidate pool. So you have to actively recruit, right? And, and so um, that's important. If you think that you're going to, to um, have a diverse hire when you just have one diverse candidate, which is probably some of the reason why there's some issues with the Rooney rule, you revert to people that look like you, right? And so if it's just one out of four, the research and the data shows that those individuals aren't going to get hired, right? And so I just think like that's, um, it, it's really important and to have a seat at the table too, right? When, when you know, Tracy just talked about it, um, like those are, are, are areas of influence and, and like that's why it's important to, because now you're also creating that pipeline as well, as well too. So um, I just think it's, it's, it's so critically important in, you know, in everything that we do, diversity, inclusion, like all of those pieces are, are um, essential for us to be able to move forward um, as a society. Thank you. He's on mute, but I do want to remind everybody that this is a reception. So occasionally take a sip and you are open. You're able to ask questions. Yep, go ahead. So please ask questions if you'd like, if you want to raise your hand so, so that we're not yellow boxing everywhere. But um, I, I do have a question from the from the chat. But if you want to say something, please, by all means, engage. Hey, uh, this is I had a Bernie. question. This is Bernie Cyber. If anybody can, you guys can hear me. My picture's not up there. Um, this question is for Wayne and maybe Tamika, and it has to do with the fact that much of our discussion revolves around the fact that these sports, football and basketball particularly, are largely represented by African-American players. However, I have noticed that Major League Baseball uh, over the years has been fairly devoid of American African-American players. I grew up in an era where there was a large number of superstars who were African-American. Uh, Woody Mays, Hank Aaron, uh, Woody Stargell. But now there seems to be somewhat of a shortage. There are a lot of African-American, uh, I should say Hispanic African players, but a very small percentage, relatively speaking, of American-born uh, black baseball players. Does anybody think that that has anything to do with the impact of the front office in baseball versus other sports? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. I'll throw some numbers out yet at you. 6% um, of the players are, are African-Americans. Um, there's three teams right now without any black players in the team. The World Series had one player in the World Series. Right. Um, that 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 hurts the promotion of of, of African Americans. If if you, you watch it and hey man, we and you're thinking hey we don't play. Now, the the best player on the field. There was one player in the World Series that was black, and he's the best player. It's Mookie Betts. Mookie Betts High, at highest paid, and, and 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 he's the best player. So that tells you a little bit about when we go out there and perform and and, and give the opportunity and play. And, and put something into it, the results we would get. The answer to getting more black players in the game was, it starts at the, at the, at the youth ages. The, the export is expensive. Um, it's dominated by travel ball. Um, it's not as, it, it doesn't promote the excitement that, that most young black men or look for, I, I'm trying to, I mean, how I can explain that. In football, you, you, you can celebrate. In basketball, you can celebrate. And in baseball, that's kind of frowned upon. 
you know, the game's yeah. changing a little bit, <laughs> but you know, uh, oh, you're, you're, it's, it's kind of like golf. You know, if you celebrate too much, you're, sh- you're a showboat. Well, that's not the point in football and that's not the point in basketball. Um, but, um, but, but it's, it's changing. It, it's changing. That old, that old way of thinking is, is kind of moving out and, it was there was more bet flips on in, in the playoffs and than I've ever seen in my life. And I, I actually kinda of, kinda of enjoy it. Um, well, it, it brings that. you kinda of answered my question. In other words, baseball still has that conservative it does. um it does, I'm sorry, it does it, to it, so to speak. It, 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 especially compared to to basketball and, and, and football. Yes, it, it it does. It does. It does. Yeah, um I mean, young kids today just don't. When I was growing up, baseball was something that we all did. And we just, you know, I see young guys today, they love basketball, they love football. And I hear a lot of young guys saying they don't even like baseball. So, you know, now what can be done about that? I I don't know. But I do think that has some impact on other levels of, you know, the front office, because if you don't have the participation, right. and attention. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think, you know, um, I put, his name slipped me. The, the gentleman, gentleman that's that's the um, VP of the Golden State Warriors. Warriors. Now, in basketball, the, the players have a lot more influence on who the manager is than baseball, and I think that's more because of the sport. And baseball is it's a lot less sh- strategic um, than in, in styles. We don't have it in baseball. You go out there and play. Um, in, in base in basketball, you have the triangle, and you have different defenses, and you and you run up and down the court. And in football, you have more of a strategy. In baseball, it's kind of just go out, go out there and play. So, I, so I, I think the players want a system. Well, in baseball, there is really isn't isn't a system. In basketball, you know, the players have more of a voice on who they what kind of system they want to be in. Um, so that's not the case in, in baseball. So the players don't really influence who, who the manager is a manager in baseball the the, the quality is they look for more of a leadership quality who can who can lead rich men <laughs> i mean players who are making a ton of money you know and and how do you have one rule for 25 different guys that are on or totally different levels right. Alan, and, and thanks Wayne. Yeah. Let, let me I, make I He's breaking up, but we have our rooms now. If you guys want to go to the breakout rooms, that way more, because I see there are a lot of baseball questions coming in and we can just, if you're open to it, Wayne, you can talk to those people. We have other questions for other sports, Uh, but the breakout rooms are open now. If you want to take me into a room, I don't, I don't have that feature in my, my... could you, uh, could you take him to a room, please? Oh, Oh, there we go. Okay, I got it, man. I have a, a Commodore 64 computer. It's all right. Okay, I see people leaving us. Uh, and I guess, uh, uh-oh. Uh, Dan had already spoken to this. Click the join button when prompted. You'll see the four buttons for breakout rooms. Miss Tracy will be staying here with Jamie and myself. Okay, okay. This, this is Jeff Allen again. I'm trying, it's not working. Where, where would you like to go, Jeff? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> okay, we've got, you want to talk to football? You want to talk baseball? You want to stay here with Tracy? I'm actually happy talking to any one of them because the question that I have applies to all of them. Okay, well, shoot, take your shot. <laughs> the question that I have is that we, we now are, or before COVID anyway, we were in the midst of a movement toward allowing schools to pay their athletes and allowing athletes to capitalize on their own name and their own fame while they're students. What difference, if any, do you think that makes with respect to the diversity question and increasing diversity in participation? I'll take that. I was just going to say, we touched on it a little bit earlier, but... I came in late, so I, if you did before... Oh, I no, no, no. It, it, what it's going to do is it's going to start le- leveling the playing field if that goes through. I mean, so here, think about it. If you go to college and you're not an athlete and you happen to start your own marketing program, right, and you start making money, 
then you're just a kid that goes to school that's a smart entrepreneur that started in college. And we hear about it later on and we're like, wow, he was smart. Okay, but if you're an athlete, you have a collar on you, right? The NCAA says you can't. And so it's very interesting what we're gonna do with this piece, but name, image and likeness is the only place that you're not gonna be able to commercially exploit the, the student. And so they're still gonna get you a shot. Um, literally just yesterday, a Twitter company came to a client of mine and these are, these are like Midwestern guys that are like the best in the Midwest. And so they're trying to, I won't mention the company, they're gonna swoop in, you know, I'm, we're gonna look at a contract and then they're gonna all of a sudden do a documentary on them and then out the door. And it's like, these kids are high school students. And so it, it, we're, we're trying to figure out the, the right line because again, it's not them doing it, it's someone doing it for them. But the whole game is so that everyone knows that we can now, we wanna make money as soon as we can. That's kind of the way it is. And we don't wanna violate any rules. I mean, if we wanna just do a big picture the players want to make money. Their families want to make money. Some kids want to finish school. Others are like, I want to finish school and make money. So again, that's what we're trying to do. And we just can't violate the NCAA rules regarding. Yeah, everybody understands you can't violate the NCAA rules. Yeah. Actually, one of the interesting things may be that we have kids staying into college more than just their freshman year when they're athletes because they can now make a reasonable amount of money while they're still in school. That's right. And they may want to not um, graduate. Have a negative impact on, on diversity participation in some of the professional sports because these kids stay in um, school. I'd want to dominate the conversation. I'm sure other people might have other thoughts as well. You're our expert. <laughs> I mean, I, the bottom line is, is that if they have a shot at being a top player and getting to the big show, they don't want to risk it. So we have many of our diverse students, black students, Hispanic students, whatever, just playing their position, quote unquote, and being safe, playing it safe. But if we open up the name, image, and likeness piece where we can now let the college student get into marketing their name, image, and likeness only, it's going to be a wonderful revenue source for our diverse candidates because a lot of them are without funds. They don't come from much, some of us, frankly. Um, and so it, it, it's good. It helps put money on the table for families that have been waiting and that want to wait, that may even want their, their, their student, their scholar to graduate. But if, if it's graduate versus going, going to the pros, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the pros. So you're right. I think to your point, some of them may stay in school a little bit longer, but if there's even the inkling that there's an opportunity for them to go to the pros, they're out, marketing or not, and, and name, image, and likeness, not so much. I don't think it has that much of an impact, but I think it does help those that are in school and, and to put some extra money in their pocket if they do it the right way. Thank you. So Tracy, does that mean they can't even uh, do things like, you know, a lot of these college or college kids have followers. And I know like on YouTube and everything, you get paid for certain, you almost become like a little influencer where you get paid per click and things. They can't even engage in things like that where they can make money off of just people following them. Correct. And that's all, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, the $200,000 question these days because everything is social media, mm -hmm. right? But we can't do it because if you can do it at that, at that level, then you've violated. So absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, no. But, but name, image, and likeness is different. So name, image, and likeness means if I'm coming to you simply for, because you're that popular and it's, you know, now I've made 50 t-shirts off of the best high school student or the best college student and that's all I've done, then that's the fine line. And that's when there's case law surrounding that right now. It's a great area to look into. But a lot of our parents are saying, um, it's okay, you know, let my scholar do that. He's smart, he's a marketing major and he's also an athlete. Why shouldn't he be able to make this money? Um, and, but then you've got the NCAA that is your pipeline into the pros. And so it's the double-edged double sword.
Hey, Kelly, Tish had a question. I lost it, but can you ask that to uh, that question? Yeah, I, I saw it. Uh, let me see. These glasses are actually not reading glasses. <laughs> They're screen glasses. So I'm like, let me take my glasses off so I can see. Okay. She says, first of all, wonderful program. Thank you for all this pa the panels. My question is, are there broader discussions shifting from diversity to equality inclusion after getting in the door? What then? After getting in which door? So for instance, after getting in to the professional world, what then, or? She didn't go in and that was it. Is Tish on with us? I think she's in the room. Yeah, she's in the room. Tish, can you uh, elaborate on that question? She's on mute. I think she's saying like, if you get hired, what what's there to help you, to, to bring you in? I think um, David Kelly might've talked about it in terms of, making sure they get business like if you're in you know if you get past that interview and you get hired how do you keep propelling through the profession whichever profession it may be you mean if you get for instance if you happen to become a, an assistant general manager at a major um at a, at a basketball team professional basketball team how do you stay how do you stay in the game so that you can matriculate up to potentially being the head coach or I think, that's what she, I think she's saying, Tish, correct me if you can speak up, but I think that's what she's getting at. Well, it's very difficult. Again, I can give you a case in point. All I can do is give stories, and stories are sometimes helpful. Um, a wonderful gentleman, the team will remain nameless, was an African-American assistant general manager, and he was great. He, people loved him, super smart, articulate. The players loved him. He could relate to the players. Again, this is a basketball assistant general manager. When the when when the guard changed and there was a um, new head coach that was brought up by the owner to try to see if they could um, you know you know sometimes when there's a trade there's a whole sweep so you have like five to seven players going in various directions and he was the one helping them figure out all these trades right because he was great because he knew everybody and he was kind of talking to the families and saying hey so and so is going to have to go. And the minute all those trades shifted happen, the chief people officer called him in the office and said, hey, here's your pink slip. And he was blown completely away. And he was just like, what? And I was just like, what? And it everybody and the players and people. So, so again, if the owner of that basketball, um, basketball team had said, hey, you can't get rid of blah, blah, blah. Are you kidding me? That's our guy. It would have been a different story, but it wasn't. So, so again, Again, I truly don't believe that there's much that you can do um, power-wise unless it's your relationship. Again, we talked about relationships at the top and, I, and I've seen it happen and I've seen people devastated. Um, uh, the director of player oper operations for a major uh, NBA team, everyone loved her. She was a former WNBA player. She had play played overseas. She was great, beautiful, tall, normal, all the guys, but she was smart. She was cool. She would tell them, don't buy five cars. Don't have 17 watches. Watch your back when you're out driving. You know, all the things you want your director of players to do, loved her. When there was, when they did the sweep and when there was a new uh, general uh, head coach, she went out too and she was devastated. Didn't even see it coming, just smacked upside the head. Again, these are two African-American front office, one had seven years in, the other had like three years in. I mean, and one is just like, I don't know, I can't even get a call back from her. She And she, we were close, it was like, are you okay? Like wellness and COVID and all this, like some of these things are hitting folks very hard in this industry. So I have not, I've, I have some negative, uh, some horror stories, frankly, because I don't see enough people in ownership that can catch some of our minority front order, I don't like the word, diverse, African-American, whatever you want to call us, um, whatever tag you want to put on us, it's not the majority. And, and they are the ones that are falling by the wayside. You know, I met a young man a couple of days ago at a farmer's market, he was 6'10". My, my eight-year-old was like, that. I'm gonna be 7'10", just like him, but you know, he's just dramatic. 
And I talked to him and he said, I said, what are you doing with your life? He's 20 years old. All he can think is basketball. He told me where he's playing and everything. I invited him to this event. Crickets. What can we do as, because we might not be in your field, but we want to help however we can as lawyers and, and, and the guidance part. What can we do? I'm like, I can't believe he's not here. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and it's good that you invited him. What I wanted to say is also just all of us on the call, we must have some interest, whether we're family members, whether we have kids that want to be athletes, whether we were athletes one day and it, it you know, it didn't, didn't help happen for us, whether we represent athletes. I, I guess what I think I should leave this panel with is, is that it's a family affair. It truly is. I mean, we have to make sure that we're watching each other's backs, whether it's your, whether it's the lawyer that's representing the player you're representing the family. You really are because um, I can't I can't tell you how many times I've had to, as a general counsel to athletes, assist the family as well. So so it, it, diversity does matter, and a lot of our majority attorneys. I think uh, someone else spoke to it after after the agent gets their three percent right, and they might have a roster. They may be at the biggest agency in the world. We can name some. They've got three letters. And they've got maybe five to 25 different players, probably 25. After they get their percentage, whatever it is, typically, you know, if it's the NFL, it's 3%, if it's, you know, whatever, then, then they, they're on to the next potential draftee sometimes. It's incumbent upon the lawyers because we're lawyers on the call. Thank you, ABA, for the lawyers to fill in that gap because there are going to be other needs besides getting drafted, right? They're going to have estate planning needs. They really will, because there may be a career ending injury, or they might need a power of attorney, or they may need um, a healthcare directive. I mean, I've had clients, you know, you get called from, the, I've been in the hospital, like with my clients and their family, and we're all just sitting there hoping to see how they're going to come out the room. And no one's ever thought about an estate plan because they can't go out and do what they were gonna do and who's gonna handle the finances. So, I mean, that's something that a lawyer can help do. Um, there are nonprofit issues, right? Some of us wanna get really philanthropic. We wanna have a foundation. As soon as we get some money and we're in the, in, in the big leagues, and that's fine. We all wanna love a charity and, 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 and a foundation and a cause. I have a client that's very close to his charity because his brother had a heart issue, right? So that was his, cause. But what he did was he tracked those organizations for a while and just gave his money to those organizations. He didn't all of a sudden say he had to now run a foundation because of the, so, so because there are also back office issues. You need to know that every year you've got to file a 990. Every year you've got to be compliant or you'll lose your status within three years. You have to, you know, make sure your team is tight. Make sure your board of directors for your foundation is if you're gonna run a camp, there's a lot of things that happen with that. How much do you play, pay those that run your camp? Um, because those are all of the expenditures that you've got a list on your 990. All of these things are, are the toolkit that we as lawyers need to wrap around our athletes, okay? It could be criminal defense. I'm not saying, but I'm just saying. I've got a call, you know, somebody went through the airport. He's from down South, he carries a gun. But he didn't realize it when he went through the, you know, the detector. So then I'm like, at whatever time in the morning, it's like, okay, I can't be there, but I have my 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 folks in New York. We're gonna figure it out. Well, that's where I would come in. They're stuck at LaGuardia. So again, there are many different facets of what you need to do to wrap yourself around your athletes. And I believe that we, as diverse lawyers, people of color, because many of our athletes are, and then those that aren't of color. Just care for them enough that it's not just a number and it's not just your percentage because there are gonna be more needs. And the uncle might wanna slip you some moonshine. And I'm like, no, I'm good. Cause you're down South with the family sitting at the table eating peach pie, whatever it takes. You just have to just be the professional, sit in whatever circumstance you're given and handle the client because it's not just the client. It's, it's typically a family affair. So that's what I would like to leave the panel with. Thank, Thank you, you so Tracy. much, Tracy. 
it we sounds are. like counsel, you know, it's true counsel in so many different facets. It's really almost the old time way, if you will, of what lawyers used to do, quite frankly. Yes, Sister Sheila. Yes. And you know that. That's a powerhouse. We have the Sheila Boston in the house. How are you? We want to recognize you and say congratulations, Jamie. We're actually closing in a minute and everybody will be coming in here. But Jamie, can we get some accolades real quick while we have you know, Miss Sheila Boston here? Well, to be clear, this is my sister, not my wife. And uh, <laughs> very proud. She is currently the president of New York City Bar, is the first woman of color to hold that position ever. And so very proud of her and many other accomplishments she has. But she spent time with tonight, and I really appreciate it. And okay. it's good to see you. But just so it, the record is clear, I'm proud of this young man right here. And he did his thing today. And I'm just so happy that this program was awesome. It really was. I so much enjoyed it. Tracy, you know I love you. Oh, we're closing now. But peace and blessings to everybody. Thank you for right. being with us. And uh, just want to thank everybody for spending the evening, afternoon with us. This has been a wonderful event. A uh, couple housekeeping announcements. Again, we want to thank our sponsor, Thomas Reuters, for our, our sponsorship. Also, our next program, January 21st, uh, Pathways to Equal Justice. Same time, it's the reform of the criminal justice um, system. And also, we I was reminded that at our mid-year, Thomas Reuters is also sponsoring the WIN program where Deborah Roberts will be our one of our speakers. So that information will be going out as well. So on behalf of the Activate Diversity team, just want to thank everybody for coming out and have a great evening. And uh, to our great moderators, Aaron and Jamie, excellent job. Thank you so much. And to Kelly, the, the uh, person who guided the ship very well done and to alfreda coward thank you for giving us the opportunity to show you that we could get it done so everybody have a great night and we'll see you at the next event and January dan sorry 21st. interrupt you as the committee chair for this as well kudos to you and to everybody great job everybody thank you and don't forget we still aren't finished for our summit for this week we still have programs tomorrow as well so Good night, everybody. Be safe and stay healthy. And we will catch you at the next event.